The Pursuit of Podcast, a purely guest-centric show focusing on people and organizations that advance positive change. Positivity can be anywhere, and in a time of vast discord, the pursuit of is finding those who champion its causes loudest. Join us as we sit and learn about the pursuits of local leaders in their community. Let's go. Hello, good people, and welcome to the Pursuit of Podcast, where it's truly not us, it's you. I'm Ryan Buck, artist development, New Leonard Media. With me, as always, is the boss, Mark Wilson, president, New Leonard Media. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, very well. The studio lights are looking proper. Everything looks that is enough of that about us. Our guest today is Angie Sanchez, PhD student, Department of Geography, Environment, and Spatial Sciences, and founder of the Nuna Project. How are you, Angie? I am great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. Thank you for being here. You look lovely. This is one of the times where it's being not a visual medium can be tough, but you are very radiant and looking very awesome today. As per usual. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody that's known or heard of Angie, her makeup (laughs) game precedes her. Her reputation (laughs) is known throughout the state. I try. Well, we're not letting anybody down, but, uh, you know, we're here to talk about the Nuna Project, uh, among other things. But from the Facebook page, I just wanted to read this. The Nuna Project is a grant funded by the Michigan Health and Endowment Fund that will work to increase breastfeeding rates in six indigenous communities in Michigan by bringing the Indigenous Breastfeeding Counselor Training Program to each community. So that sounds pretty simple, but first, the name. What inspired the name? The Nuni Project was named actually by my friend, a good friend of mine, Melissa. I consider her sister, and uh, she's actually a role model of mine when it comes to lots of things, motherhood, parenting, et cetera. And I just put a call out to Facebook people because the name that we gave it when we were applying for the grant was really long and obnoxious. (laughs) And (laughs) when I was writing the grant in my head, because I was a first year PhD student, and this is the first grant that I ever wrote for, And I was applying for a half a million dollars in my head. This was all just practice. There was no way I was getting this grant. I was just like, I'm just running through the motions. So my advisor kind of threw this name in there, said, how about we call it this? And I was like, yeah, sure. I signed off on it. And then we got it. And I was like, oh, no, I can't keep repeating this because it's really long and obnoxious. So I'm going to Shorten it. So what you went with was so still went, kind of long-ish? Yes. Okay. Because you couldn't change it. Like the application oh to goodness. the grant was already submitted. Wow. So in order to put this out to the people, like to put the project out there, I needed to have a name that stuck. And Nuni is a word in Ojibwe that describes the act of breastfeeding. Like, I don't think there's like an actual direct translation of it, but right. that's essentially what it means. It's the like the act of breastfeeding. Beautiful. So that's why I decided to go with it because that represented it. I think it's quite appropriate. Yeah. So for our listeners, can we hear the grant title? <laughs> to be perfectly honest, you have to I, write it down. I, I, I don't even remember what it is, <laughs> but it's something along the lines of Michigan... It starts with Michigan, so it starts with an M. Yes, the Michigan Breastfeeding um, Initiative that embraces Native American culture. Rolls right off the tongue, (laughs) doesn't it? Actually, that's not so bad because I I, I participated in some research projects that were real doozies. It was a full paragraph for the title, you know. Right. And normally there's like differences in outcomes between this many delineated men and women and... yeah. Ryan's glasses and <laughs> yeah, yep. uh, just words yeah. thrown in there to, yes. to throw yeah. them in there. Well, Nunius is what you said and, and what the mission is. I think the name having cultural relevance is important. Yeah. But when you think about when you conceived of this through MSU and with your advisor, where are you now compared to where you thought you'd be? Where am I at in terms of like where we're at with the project? Correct. So we're in the very tail end of it. We had initially planned to do like three of the trainings in 2021 and then 2022. And then because of COVID and everything else, everything got pushed back. And the Indigenous Breastfeeding Counselor Training Program is the program that we, it's the training program that we are bringing to six different Indigenous communities in Michigan. And because of COVID, their schedule, they had to cancel all their previously scheduled events. So to get on their schedule, 
we had to wait till they got through everything that got canceled on their schedule first. Wow. And then we could get in. So we're doing all of our trainings basically right now. And the grant ends at the end of August or at the beginning of August. Okay. So we're basically smashing all these trainings in at the end wow. of the, the grant. But we're getting it done and it's fine. So. so as it stands right now, how many are in the organization? It isn't just you pushing this all forward or is it? For the grant, it's just my advisor and me working through Michigan State. But the grant itself is I'm using the grant funds to pay for the Indigenous Breastfeeding Counselor training to come to six different Indigenous communities in Michigan. And I'm going to shorten that to IBC just because that's a whole lot. The IBC training. This was developed by an Indigenous woman who's from Seattle and it's an LLC that she started and she wanted to center Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous families, Indigenous people and indigenous communities in teaching breastfeeding knowledge. So they are involved, but that's because, you know, they're basically the experts and we're bringing them in to do the training. What happens is they come in, they do 45 hours worth of lactation education. But like I said, centering indigenous knowledge and indigenous people. And then whoever is in attendance at the end of the course gets a certificate that says they're a certified indigenous breastfeeding counselor. And that's excellent. Yeah. What I think is really interesting and what I think our listeners would really appreciate hearing is uh, your advisor, Dr. Sue Grady, is your partner in this, as you mentioned. And what was the process of pitching this? You mentioned a grant and half a million dollars. (laughs) And for folks who may have similar pursuits, how did you approach this? I do have to give a shout out to Michigan State Department of Geography. I myself have had a great run at Michigan State in the Department of Geography. I've had a lot of support from faculty there in the department. That's not the case for all students, and it's especially not the case for many Indigenous students. Many Indigenous graduate students struggle in graduate school. They're just not offered a lot of support. And like I said, this is just my experience. I don't know if this is how it is at other universities or even within Michigan State. I don't even know if other departments are the same way. But the graduate students are constantly, I'm going to use the word bombarded, but it's in a good way, bombarded with opportunities. So between the department chair and other faculty members within the department, even other faculty outside of the department, And our graduate advisor within the department, they are constantly sending us emails and opportunities with fellowships, scholarships, work opportunities, research opportunities, grants, research funds, all these things. So it's on top of everything else you got to deal with. Yeah. So we get all these emails and this happened across our email one day. The department chair said specifically called out to myself and Dr. Grady and said, hey, this looks like something that might be up your alley. Take a look. So we looked at the grant and I looked at some of the previous things that the Michigan Health Endowment Fund, because they fund a lot of things, but in this particular nutrition and lifestyles grants, a lot of the things that I was seeing in past awardees was like programs where they were giving folks coupons for buying food at a farmer's market or exercise programs within a school, or things like that. It was a nutrition and lifestyle type stuff. Right. I just said to her, I think that I can frame breastfeeding in the way that fits what they're trying to fund. And this was all just based on my research, right? They're trying to, the Michigan Health Endowment Fund is trying to decrease healthcare disparities in communities that see these great disparities in healthcare. And so that's what happens to Indigenous people. We have great healthcare disparities. We suffer high rates of diabetes and suicide and addictions and depression and all these things. Well, breastfeeding reduces your risk for many of those things. It reduces risk of cancers in moms. It reduces risks of certain cancers in the kids. It reduces diabetes. And that's real. There are real issues at stake here because morality rates for Indigenous mothers and infants are particularly higher in general. And that's so there's a litany of challenges that are present to an Indigenous person, a new mom. Is that something that really fueled you in this? Did you think, because I know you also had a particular attachment to yourself to this issue with your own son. Yes. The mortality rates, 
is a concern, yes, but that wasn't one of my initial reasons for applying for this and for even doing this research. My initial reason for getting into this was that I was just sitting one day after having struggles with breastfeeding my own son, who is four now, um, realizing that I had access to some resources to help me figure that problem out that I wouldn't have had if I was living up here and living in my own community. Financial resources, my husband having a really good job that we could afford at the time, $150 cash to pay for an IBCLC to come to our house to do an evaluation of my son's latch and just a bunch of other things that just started coming into play. And I was like, is this happening to other women? Are they having struggles and not having access to resources? I was in the greater Lansing area at the time, and there's this thing called the Lansing Baby Cafe, where lactation consultants volunteer their time. It's every, I mean, at the time it may have changed, but at the time it was every Wednesday morning. Right. You could show up and just get help with breastfeed your breastfeeding concerns and it was free and it didn't cost anybody anything i don't know of anything like that happening up here maybe it does i don't know that's called the lansing baby cafe yeah and i was just like how come we don't have these same resources and i was just thinking about my home community which is up here in northern michigan and being a tribal member and i also remembered even in the like in our tribal clinic i don't recall seeing breastfeeding supportive materials not even posters like there was a time back You know, when we were younger, you would see these posters up on the walls about quitting smoking. And they had indigenous people. My niece was even in one of them when she was a baby, her (laughs) and her mom. And I was A smoking ad? Yeah. Oh, she wasn't the one quitting smoking. Okay, gotcha. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, just checking. I was like, why don't we have any of that? And even some of our own tribal healthcare workers don't promote breastfeeding. And what's the culture like? Are we promoting it in the workspace? Do we give moms time to pump? Do we give moms time to breastfeed? There's just all these questions started coming up. And it was a problem that I wanted to solve. But prior to doing this, I didn't have a health degree. My career had been spent in the business world and helping businesses make money. It was just very business oriented. It was not medical related whatsoever. Right. I knew I wanted to go back to school and I needed to figure out a way to get some type of health related degree in order to be able to do this kind of work. And this is just kind of where I landed was in health and medical geography. Well, you mentioned your time with MSU. You have a BA in communication, arts and sciences, an MBA in business administration, management and operations, and currently pursuing your PhD. Yes. That's a lot of years of continuing academic pursuit, excellence. So what was the end game early on when you started (laughs) with that first degree? What was in your mind? What was inspiring you then? Oh, gosh. So that was a long time ago. (laughs) And honestly, what was inspiring that was I am not going to live the life that I was brought up in. I'm going to provide a better life for myself and any possible future family that I might have. I had no interest in having a husband and a kid at the time, and I didn't for a really long time. Sure. (laughs) But I thought if one day I might have a kid or kids... And a husband, I'd like to not be living the life that I grew up in. So I used education as my way to get out of it. So So it was the idea. It was the idea of opportunity. Yeah. It wasn't specifically one focus and it wasn't going for this developed over time. I honestly had no interest in communications whatsoever. I was initially a math major because I thought I wanted to be a math teacher. And I went through the whole thing. And That's got to be a first yeah. that anybody's at least admitted that on our podcast and probably in general that they wanted to be a math teacher. Yeah, I am like super, super good at math and <laughs> teach and tutoring math. I'm very good at tutoring. That's what I, why I was like, oh, well, I must be a teacher. Right. Well, tutoring and teaching math are two completely different things. So I figured that out, decided that wasn't for me. And I also was sick of Michigan State at the time. And one of my advisors was like, you have enough communications credits to graduate next month if you switch your major. And I was like, sweet, sign me up. So I just switched my major to communications real right. quick because I had taken a bunch of communications classes. Sure. They just seemed easy. Yeah. And it was about moving forward. Yeah. And gaining that. Yeah. And you mentioned your working career. Also very impressive. You've held elevated leadership positions with 
Grand Travers Resort and Casinos, Grand Travers Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians, Consumers Energy. And again, you mentioned that there may have been some gaps, but were there things with that corporate and some government experience that felt has helped you in this journey? For sure. Every single position that I've held, I've learned something greatly from that position. A lot of times it wasn't until after I left. Sometimes it happened while I was there. But each one of them pushed me to the next step and was somehow in some way probably a catalyst to moving on to the next thing. So Wow. And you've been quoted as saying you're a lifelong Spartan. What does that mean? <laughs> I have been a fan of Michigan State since I was a kid, and I don't really know why. I'm, you know, a first-generation college graduate, and that wasn't a thing for us as a kid. Like, we weren't going to Michigan State games. Like, that's where a lot of people get hooked on schools right. that they like. Through sports it, yes, and their parents, and, yeah. you know, jubilation over. Yep, exactly. And I didn't have any of that. My aunt went to Michigan State when I was a teenager and I came and visited her a couple times, but it still, I don't know where it came from. I just got obsessed with Michigan State and knew that's where I wanted to go to school. And that's, that's what incredible. we did. <laughs> you drew on some of your experience with your own son. And in your particular case, there was also uh, a physical condition that was yes. that was mentioned. How often when you were f- trying to frame this, were you having to factor in those kind of things, whether there are physical challenges when you're trying to help as many people as possible? Physical challenges in breastfeeding is just one of many issues that come up that are kind of decrease breastfeeding rates or that cause people to quit breastfeeding before they're ready to to quit. It's just, it's one, in our particular instance, it was a tongue tie. There are things called tongue ties and lip ties. Most people don't even know about them or have ever even heard of them. And even if their child had them or if you had them. Right. And that um, requires a dental fix. That's Yes. It's either a, dent, a pediatric dentist with experience in it or an ENT. And they both have to be regularly practicing in assessing for those right. and releasing them. You can't just go to any pediatric dentist. And if I can ask, how in general expensive is something like this when uh, families are looking at these things? So we used a pediatric dentist somewhere in the greater Detroit area, and I had to pay out of pocket because it wasn't covered by my insurance. Again, that's another access thing. My husband was able to say, yes, here's the... And I think at the time we paid $600 to have his tongue tie released. It was literally a 30-second procedure. Like they opened up his mouth, lasered it, and within 30 seconds. part of you thinking like, yeah. if I had the right tools at home, I probably could have pulled this off, but well, no. I mean, some midwives do it like <laughs> oh, at my home, goodness. but wow. with scissors, right? Oh. Because like, you, you can, most, the release is either done with scissors or with a laser. So, wow. and they don't numb the babies. So, oh, just get right just get it. right in. Because okay. that shot's going to hurt just as much as the clipping is. So, might as well, <laughs> just right. do it. <laughs> Looking at your own journey, how important to you and to the work was it that you became yourself an Indigenous breastfeeding counselor in 2019? Was that critical to this journey or? It was critical to the journey in terms of, so when I was coming to Michigan State or coming to the point of like, I want to go back to school and figure out a a solution to this problem, I wanted to use my business background to bridge the gap between the people that have the resources or the money to the people that need it. It was actually pretty critical to the whole thing. I could have just as easily gone back to school to become a nurse. So then I could become a nurse practitioner and work in a pediatrician's office or even become a pediatrician or go get a second master's degree in public health. I didn't want any of that. And I also did not want to be a practitioner. I, I actually don't want to be a breastfeeding counselor. That's not my specialty. It's not what I want to spend my time doing. I want to use my business background to make access easy for Indigenous people. How can I advocate for the things that they need if I don't know what it is that the Indigenous breastfeeding counselor needs? So I did the training for the purpose of one, learning, and two, just learning about breastfeeding in general, but also learning about what communities need 
in order to support breastfeeding in their communities. And that's why I did the training. I do counsel women because people come to me all the time asking for advice and I have no problem giving it to them. I'm saying that's not the work that I want to do. There are some women who this is the work that they want right. to do and that is all that they do. And that's great. And that's perfect for them. What I wanted to do, to do is be the business person for them, connecting them to the people that need their help but getting them paid and getting them the resources they need in order to do their work. Absolutely. The, the, the hustle. Yeah. The real hustle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you mentioned in general workplace and workplaces potentially, and, and you didn't say this, but it, I'm just ex extrapolating on the thought of workplaces having comfortable place for women to breastfeed and things yes. like that. Are you finding that the conversation is still, because it's a difficult conversation, right? In a workplace in general, even saying the word breastfeeding, it's a hot topic. You have celebrities on TV with their opinions on it. Are you finding the conversation about it now is a little bit more open regardless, as opposed to let's say five to six years ago? I would say that it's probably a little bit more open in my world because I'm immersed in it. That's all I see. So I'm not ever in spaces where breastfeeding is not a big thing, but I give an example. I'm in some of the Facebook breastfeeding groups that are like national groups where breastfeeding people come in there to, to get advice and whatnot. And I follow them solely for the purposes of keeping my eye what's going on in the world sure. and learning about other conditions or other problems that people have with breastfeeding. So in those groups, you'll see every now and then somebody will post, I really want to go to the restaurant, but I have my baby and I'm afraid to breastfeed while I'm in the restaurant because I'm afraid what my family's going to say right. or what the restaurant is going to say. So those things still happen. And I'm sure if I'm not, like I said, I'm immersed in a very pro breastfeeding world. So right. I don't see that as often, but I'm sure that it's still out there. But also, yes, I still think the conversations now compared to five years ago are probably a lot more open and a, a bit of a better place, yeah. but yeah. still a long way to go. Yeah. From a 2021 record Eagle article, it stated, and I found this really fascinating, that quote, indigenous mothers and babies statistically represent one of the lowest exclusive breastfeeding rates at six months of age of any race or ethnicity in the nation. Can you explain why that's important? Yes. So it's important because we need, so we have great, and when I say we, I'm talking about indigenous people, we have great initiation rates. So most of us, after we have babies, we'll try, like we'll immediately, we'll be trying to breastfeed. The problem is that within the first day, from day one to about day 14, somewhere in between there, we quit. And it's because we're is not having- Is that just statistically what you found? Yes. Okay. And For Two weeks. Two weeks. And so it's critical those first two weeks that mothers and breastfeeding and chest feeding people are getting the support that they need during those first day one to day 14. The problem is we don't necessarily have people giving us the right support. And so the data that I pulled that from was This is the people. acronym episode. This is a yes. tough one. But <laughs> you can see what folks like Angie have to deal with. Yes. <laughs> In their lives, in these pursuits. So it's healthy people. So healthypeople.gov mm -hmm. has these five-year increments of goals that they want for people in the United States to reach. And so I was looking at 2015 data and what the goals were. And that's where I saw the disparity. I saw Indigenous people initiating breastfeeding, mm -hmm. but then by three months, we dropped significantly, whereas other groups of people, white, Asian Latin people are higher. They still decrease. Mm -hmm. Everybody decreases. Right. But our rate decreases at a much faster More. rate than other groups. Right. And the World Health Organization and other outside of the United States groups push breastfeeding for a minimum of two years. Here in the United States, they say six months, six months to a year. And so we, we're trying to get Indigenous people to be exclusively breastfeeding up until at least that six month right. mark. And it's important for so many reasons that would take another hour of talking, but just the health benefits of exclusively breastfeeding our babies for six months 
But the gist of it is it comes down to healing us and not just like from physical stuff. It's right. the bonding and attachment that happens between a mom and a baby. And for me, it was just a first step in healing all the things that we as Indigenous people are suffering from, generational trauma that we're dealing with. This is one way of healing some of those things for Absolutely. us. Absolutely. And in that same article, it also mentions that only 25% of mothers overall reach the goal of exclusively feeding from mom for the first six months. So is a national conversation about this even good for what Indigenous families are going through? It can be, yes. But again, the focus nationally oftentimes excludes Indigenous people and Black people, and our rates are the worst. So... Like the really the focus should be on those groups and the national, I don't think that the national focus is, it's just on breastfeeding in general. But we have specific needs, right? Both of our communities, the indigenous communities and black communities have specific needs for their groups of people that will help encourage breastfeeding in their communities. And that is why one of the reasons why Cami started the Indigenous Breastfeeding Council training, because she was like, we need to address specific needs that Indigenous people have that you won't get from just your average IBCLC training right. or whatever right. other lactation trainings are out there. So you're an inspiring person. <laughs> it's And, and it just because I, I've, I've known you before, we've sat down here in, in many of these interviews, I'm meeting somebody for the first time, but you are very inspiring. Was there somebody along the way, along your journey that inspired you to do what you've done and take the the risks that you've taken? Well, there were lots of people and there isn't like one single person that I could point to other than my kid, Frankie. He really was the catalyst for all of this. He is, Indigenous people uh, oftentimes refer to their kids as sacred bundles, right? Or like bundles of medicine. And that's what he is for me. He's right. been very healing for me personally. He has been my, yeah, for sure, my biggest idol even, right? Like I'm trying to make a better world for him. And in order to to do that, I have to be a better person and I have to be a better mom. And so I have to learn and un unlearn some of the things that I learned growing up of, about parenting and about even being a friend to people. I have to unlearn some of those things and learn new, healthier right. um, things. But then just... I have role models that are my friends who are the mothers, right? Like I take things from them. Everybody, even my own grandfather, they're just people who I've learned good things from. And then I take and learn from them the things that I need to learn. And while they might not be overall like a perfect role model, you can also, you can always learn something from somebody. Right. So I take little bits and pieces from pretty much everybody I come in contact with. Well, how wonderful, because to have had so many people that you actively took inspiration from, and I'm guessing you weren't passive in this, so you engaged. But when you think about all those people and how they may have helped you, can you think back to one piece of advice you got along the way that at the time sounded insane, but now made all the sense or makes all the sense in the world? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> There is like lots of small <laughs> pieces of advice that people have given me and they all relate to different things. One in particular that happened with breastfeeding, since we're talking about the project, because I can give you some other quotes, <laughs> is, well, two things, two very vital things happened early on in my breastfeeding. And one was to not quit on your worst day. So a lot of moms will quit when it's the absolute worst, like right. it, this hurts or I'm hurting or well, all these things are happening. So that was one is to not quit on your worst day. And the other, this was actually probably more impactful for me, was something along the lines of, you know, breastfeeding is natural, right? It's very natural, as natural as breathing is. The problem is that it doesn't come as second nature to us. It's a learned thing. We have right. to learn about it. Some moms don't have that problem. They can just pop the baby right on and they never have an issue. But for a lot of us, that's not the case. And so... That's not the technical term, right? Popping the baby on? That's what we say a lot. Because you are... 
You heard it here, folks. <laughs> I, I Could that be use, a t-shirt? Yeah, yes, I, I don't use technical pop it, terms Popping off at the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, wow. that was... Uh, it can be easier for some, but for yeah. others, and, and you mentioned there's there could be pain involved. There are more challenges that these women are dealing with than probably anybody could know. Yep. And a lot of them, and I'm just totally making this number up, but it's a number that lives in my head, so I'm going to keep it. 80% of breastfeeding issues are all up in the mind of the mom. You literally just need to talk somebody through an right. issue that they're having. How often... Do you think, and maybe it's a scary thought to think about, because of this being a sensitive issue, how many indigenous women are having a challenge and they just are ashamed to say anything? They don't have support around them. What's the way to to get to that person to say it's okay to say, I'm struggling with this? So, I, and I might be biased, but I feel like with an indig- with indigenous women that we're, we don't have those shame feelings. We have the, I don't know who to go to for help. So they just quit because they don't have anybody to reach out to. You know, a lot of us were not breastfed and we didn't grow up around breastfeeding people. Whereas in other cultures and especially around the world, that's the normal thing. So babies grow up seeing their siblings being breastfed, seeing other people breastfeeding out in public because it's not a thing outside of this country. (laughs) So it's normal for people to grow up seeing that in the United States. It's a thing and people just don't see it. And especially in indigenous communities, I feel like we see it a little bit more, but we just don't know who to reach out to when we're breastfeeding. And that's how it was for me. Like I knew ancestors were coming in when I was pregnant. This is what you need to do. But I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing. And I can't ask my mom or any of my aunts because they didn't do this. So. His family is the first place you look typically. Yes. And. When you have questions and you don't know that there are resources, that can be very difficult. What I find very interesting about all this is Governor Whitmer has shown her support for breastfeeding. A proclamation was even signed. There is specific language that addresses some indigenous women's needs. August 2020 was declared, I believe, Breastfeeding Awareness Month. There's a week dedicated to it. All that's well and good. What's your opinion on that? Is is buy-in from a state's governor and months dedicated to it? Is that a good thing? Is that enough? And how can you activate on that to make it worthwhile? It is helpful. I was actually one of several Indigenous people that helped get that to Governor Whitmer's desk. Well, and get, wow. <laughs> yeah. And to get that legislation or that proclamation signed, it's seems small and it might seem like it's not helpful, but really it is, right? It puts conversation out there. It gets people to understand we're one of, there are a few states that already, so when you're comparing states, like we all vary greatly in like breastfeeding support, like an example, where where Seattle's at, where, where's that Washington. at? Washington. Washington mm-hmm. is a very pro breastfeeding, pro doula pro home Seattle's pro a lot of stuff it's a pretty fun place and so they're in a completely different space than we are that's where Cammie lives the one that did the IBC oh my goodness um, wow that built that program but we're actually trying to model other legislation what they came up with in Washington anyway getting back to Governor Whitmer it's helpful it brings the conversation to the forefront and it brings up some of the things that we've been screaming about for years about what our needs are and what we need, you know, in order to increase breastfeeding rates in our communities. Right. In a 2020 MSU article, you were quoted, and this is wonderful, as saying breastfeeding in our communities is viewed as ceremony. Can you expound on that? Yes. So breastfeeding generally is just looked at as like a thing that you do when you have a baby because Another that's, how burden. You, that's how you feed the Gotta baby. Feed the baby. People generally view breastfeeding as ceremony because the act of breastfeeding itself, it's not just getting milk from one human to another. There's so many things going on physiologically, physically, emotionally, mentally that are going on between a mother and a baby during the whole entire breastfeeding duration, like not just the 
20 minutes in the morning from the age baby first coming to this realm to when they stop breastfeeding, like that whole six months, a year, two months, however long that the breastfeeding journey is, that whole time is really sacred between a mother and a baby. And everything that they do, it's a it's a special time. Like I said, it's so much more than just getting milk from the mom to the baby. Right. Things are going on physio- physiologically that even we don't even understand for the most part. I feel like that's the more accurate way to sum it up. It, it really is. There, there is much more. It is a transference. I think there's magic in there too. There's something. For sure. And it's <laughs> such a, it, I, I was really taken by that because if you have to try to simplify the message, if you have to try to say, this is why this is important, not because it's helping our children grow up and live healthier lives, but it is a part of the fabric of who we are. Yes. And I feel that somebody <laughs> can receive that a little better and go, okay, this is important. And somebody who's struggling with this does need help. But when you look at all the support systems that are you know, hopefully there, specifically as we're looking at indigenous moms and babies, what types of roles are the dads, extended family playing in this, specifically when there is a challenge present? In indigenous communities, this is not like cited research. This is just my own perspective when I'm out in the world because I spend time in indigenous communities, not just doing this, but in indigenous communities, there's so many more people involved in breastfeeding than just the mom and the baby. Dads are, they're actually vital and critical to a successful breastfeeding journey. Moms or grandparents, aunties, uncles, sisters, siblings, because um, there are some things that are just like super simple that can help a mom that's going to keep her off of that ledge of, you know, quitting. And it's different for different people. Some moms just need the dude to be up with them at, when they're in the middle of the night. So they don't feel like they're the only person having to lose sleep. Sometimes that's a, it's just a simple thing for the dude to just be up right. and not doing anything. Or for me, it was a lot of, I spent a lot of time on the couch with the baby. Mm-hmm. And so it was like, he was bringing me snacks and water and anything else that I might need that I didn't necessarily need to get up and do myself. And why was that essentially helpful to you? Because I probably would have quit. No, I say that, but I wouldn't have because I was just so determined to do it. That's why we were successful. But you're saying a simple thing means means a lot. Yep. I had a friend of mine drive all the way over from Detroit. And you know what she did for an entire day was did my laundry. She cooked some food. She prepped some meals. And that was it. There was no like... I'm going to come over here and help take the baby while so you can do things. Right. She did those things and that was it. That was very impactful for me. Dads can do that. Aunties, uncles can do that. I had another friend who came over just to come talk to me about my mental health. She was like, let's go to breakfast. We need to talk about how are you, how are you doing and how can we help you? This was before we, Frankie was, his tongue tie was fixed when we were struggling. And just the, like I said, that was the emotional and mental support that I needed. Anybody can do that. And um, the thing is, we need to equip people with that knowledge. So I feel like dads would be more supportive if they knew that that helps. That helps you to just bring her some water instead of saying, well, she could get up and get it herself. Yeah, she can. She absolutely can. But it'd be nice if you would just bring it to her. I think it's probably good a rule in general, not just within the confines of a struggling breastfeeding situation. In general, just default to just well, do it just because. Acts of service are always appreciated. <laughs> right. right. Um, so I have two sons, both born at home. One didn't take mm-hmm. different mothers, but that's just the situation. And the other was breastfed for the period of time that you've suggested, like up to a year. And I can't say for certain that there's a direct correlation, but one was sick more than the other mm-hmm. growing up mm-hmm. and it, o- among other things. But one thing that when you talk about things that husbands can do or be trained for is sometimes the understanding of peer pressure mm-hmm. and strength. Ryan had brought that up about the national conversation. 
And to my shame, I admittedly was uncomfortable, like at the mall, despite a blanket being covered up, yeah. but, the, but the boy needs to eat and she's going to sit down here. And it's like, ah, can't, can't we get going first? And then, and that's 15 years ago. Yeah. But uh, in that time, it took a lot of, of learning on my behalf to understand how negative that was and, and yep. how uh, more impactful it could have been to sit there with her, grab her anything, just with our head held high, you know, yeah. my boy's eaten. Like it should be normalized. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Almost to a point of pride. Yes. In a way, and not to bring pride before a fall or anything like that, but, you know, to say I'm doing this and, but that, that's a really great point. And, and I'm trying to think about, you know, those moments where I may have felt the same and, and it wasn't as talked about as much when our kids were young, but I think it's important. And you were also quoted in uh, that MSU article as saying that this knowledge had been taken away from indigenous peoples through colonization. Yes. And you mentioned trauma before. Yes. And how much of that lingering kind of generational trauma is still present within the confines of these challenges with breastfeeding? I think it's very present, but I think the problem is that we don't necessarily recognize the cause of it. So I very often make the case that we, indigenous people, are in this situation that we're in, not having great breastfeeding rates, initiation rates, and duration rates, solely because of colonization. We can go back to the times. So as we were just talking about, breastfeeding, it's a, it's a community thing. It's not a just a between two people. Like it takes a lot of people to make this happen and to have it be successful. You need support. You need resources. You need knowledge. We have been stripped of our ways of living that we used to live in where we had communities and we had, like I said, these are this is in indigenous communities, this is actual ceremony. Like the birth is a ceremony and breastfeeding is ceremony. And, and there are some communities where they will go for like a certain amount of time after birth, like 30 days, or I don't know what, what it is in different um, communities, but they like the mom and the baby are just like, like people will come over and they feed them and cook for them. And they do all these other things because they're honoring that time after birth to let the mom and baby just be mom and baby and not have to worry about cooking and cleaning and taking kids to school and all these other things. So back, whatever, a hundred years ago or whatever, our communities were different and we lived closer together. We might have lived in little pockets of of communities, of villages, and you would have aunties and grandmas coming over to help and teach you these things. And they had this knowledge. So they knew there was sometimes that there were things like tongue ties and other issues that would happen, other milk transfer right. issues that might may come up. They knew about them, but they knew how to get around them or how to fix them. We don't have that anymore because we don't have those communities anymore. And then specifically talking about boarding schools and residential schools, we were, our children were ripped from their homes, from their mothers and fathers and put into residential schools and boarding schools and kept away from their home. And sometimes, oftentimes didn't make it ever make it back. To away their from communities. their home and their traditions and yes. their language. So they didn't see these things. They didn't see their mom breastfeeding their siblings. They didn't get to breastfeed themselves because some of them were taken away at very young ages. Some of them, these were literal babies ripped from the hands of their mothers and put into these residential schools. So they didn't get to breastfeed themselves. So it's this whole big, long story of right. how we were forced out of the ways that we used to live and the ways that we used to share knowledge. It's a topic that has, I think, organically come up on this podcast <laughs> many times. And I'm so glad that you have continued to usher that discussion about the boarding schools and reclamation of language and tradition, because it's an important conversation to be having. And I'm glad you, you brought that up. And it leads me to a question that is something that that indigenous people face that I, I believe is one of many challenges is having people separate the archetype or the stereotype with reality. Indigenous people are spoken of in textbooks uh, in the past tense and almost yes. like a, a museum quality. Yeah. 
is bringing to light a kind of ubiquitous challenge like breastfeeding good? Is that something that can help with with that kind of issue with stereotypes and saying they have this challenge too? Is that something else that can further assuage that? You know, I never thought of it that way. I'm sure it probably can help. Um, But for me, honestly, I'm not that concerned with what non-Indigenous people think about our existence because it doesn't matter. Like we're here and we're doing our things despite whatever they think or say or feel. I I was going to quote you again, but I realized that we still exist. <laughs> it we're and, and it really again your words uh, really do pop off the page, and it's it's very apparent that you have so much passion and being able to articulate something like this and take this singular uh, challenge to elevate it and and bring resources to folks who are really struggling is amazing. And I I saw a photo, and it's on the Facebook page. Now, do you have a website or because we always like to talk about how to promote, there is a Facebook page. Is there a website that we can talk about as well? We're in the middle of building the Nooney Projects webpage. It's not done yet, but this is because MSU, it's an MSU hosted page and MSU is, yeah, here's all the directions for building your page. Oh, there you go. And we're like, (laughs) me and my advisor are like, "Uh, yeah, we are not web page developers, but I guess we're going to have to try to figure this out. So well, I mean, you know, I'll help you I, out. I use, yeah, I have a, a Facebook page called the Nooney Project and an Instagram page. And eventually we will have this MSU page and we're trying to get it done before the rest of our trainings happen so we can point people to it. But do you have the URL? I do not. Okay. So it's not like going to be like the new name project dot MSU dot yes. no, no, no. Or... Right. I'm sorry. Yes, we do have it. I thought you meant like, do I know off the top of my head? I don't. But oh. yes, we do have it. It's like it's already like you. I could show you what it looks like. It's already. All right. So there. you do have a URL. I'll, yeah. I'll say it in the closing remarks. Yeah. All right. And you had said this is an issue that you want to, quote, spend the rest of your life fixing. And you mentioned that. This grant is up at the beginning of August. What's the next step? It's to continue to do this kind of work. How is that going to happen? I have no idea, but we'll make it happen. There's the option of consulting. I could continue to do research. I could become faculty somewhere and still continue to do this research. I could start my own consulting company and do the same thing, get grants and put it out there into the communities that need it. It's up in the air right now, Absolutely. but there's lots of ways that it can happen. So we'll see what happens. On the Facebook page, there's a, I don't know where this photo was taken or this quote is amazing. And it's, quote, when we breastfeed, we are feeding our babies generations of indigenous resistance, love and resurgence. Yes. I don't know. Where, where did the, that come from? I don't know where the quote came from either. But again, because I'm immersed in the breastfeeding world, I see lots of lots of memes, graphics, infographics, knowledge, all kinds of things just gets passed through my regular newsfeed. And I saw that somebody, it's actually a, somebody put it on their wall. Like it's a graphics on a wall. Yeah. And I was like. That's what it looks like. It's it's powerful. Yes. Now, if you mentioned the website is forthcoming, there is the Facebook page. Are there any other resources for somebody who may be listening or hears about this, is there any anybody who's struggling at all, a resource that you'd send them to outside of the Nooney Project? So I don't know of any uh, specific like websites or anything like that, but there's a whole gang of us that are willing to help people, right? So reaching out for me, that's kind of the cool thing about Indigenous people and how we're doing this because yeah, in other, any other health disparities that are out there, sure, there's probably a website or someplace you can go to for help. Right. With us, it's reaching out to the people that you know or reaching out to somebody who, who knows somebody. So Absolutely. for us, it's just reaching out to the people that we know. People could reach out to, there's also the Indigenous Breastfeeding Counselor page. It's a Facebook page. Okay. And while they don't necessarily post help stuff, There are people there, and if somebody were to reach out to the page and say, hey, I need help, I have an issue, can you talk to me? They would 
contact the person back and try to help them with their whatever Excellent. they're struggling with. Amazing. Well, Angie, thank you so much for your pursuits and to all of those who pursue along with you ensuring Indigenous mothers and families receive the training support and resources they need to feed their babies and reconnect with tradition. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. Thank you so much for this. And to our listeners, thank you so much for listening and thank you for pursuing the positive. Ladies and gentlemen, on the behalf of New Leonard Media, I want to thank you for joining us again on the Pursuit of Podcast. A Kachi Miigwech to Angie Sanchez and the Nuna Project for coming in. I said that I would include in the show notes the URL. That website is now live. You can find it at nooniproject.com. N-O-O-N-I project.com. And as always, for everything audio, visual, podcasting, check us out at newleonard.com. <laughs> <laughs>